Hello and welcome to our latest question of the week. This week's question of the week is going to be on evangelism. My name's Richard um, and I'm uh, one of the pastoral interns here at Grace Bible Church Holland Park and I'm joined by my two fellow uh, Grace Bible Churchians. On my right I have Cobus. Yes, yes, hi, I'm Cobus and been at Grace for about oh, five years now and we've done a few of these videos so I think People will probably know who we are by now. Mm. And on my left. G'day everybody. Um, I'm Andrew. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm also an intern at the church and been at the church for going on three years, um, but have uh, been a member and an intern for about a year and a half to two. Cool. Great. Well, we've got some great questions tonight, and so hopefully uh, the Lord will lead us in answering these questions. So the first question we have on our list is, what is the gospel? What do you guys think about that? Well, the gospel literally means the good news, and the good news can be summed up in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So Romans chapter 1 verse uh, 16 tells us, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So seeing as it is the very power of God for salvation, we really need to know what the gospel is. And when, whenever we start talking about the gospel, we need to start with how the Bible talks about who God is and who man is, who, who we are. So the Bible describes God as good, uh, as righteous, as holy. He's our creator, and he's the, the sovereign Lord of all the universe. Uh, but instead of honoring and worshiping him as our creator, we have all sinned, and we have fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, we lie, we steal, we uh, hate each other, we blaspheme God's name, we gossip, we slander, we think lustful thoughts. We are not good. We are lawbreakers in God's sight and we are sinners. So the whole Bible and the whole Christian message comes down to this question. How can a holy God forgive and pardon guilty sinners like us? Right? So if he simply forgives us, then sin goes unpunished and therefore he's no longer just. Whereas if he gives us pure justice, then every one of us stands condemned and will be sent to hell for the eternal punishment uh, for our sins. So what's the good news? With that black backdrop, what is the good news of the gospel? Uh, the famous verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So God the Father, out of his rich mercy and love, sent forth Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, to take on flesh, uh, being born of a virgin. Uh, he lived the perfect, sinless life, never sinning for a millisecond in thought or in deed. And then he laid down his life by dying on a cross. Now, Jesus didn't die on a cross as an example. Uh, he didn't die as a, a martyr. Uh, Jesus died as a substitute. So on the cross, all the sins of all the people who would ever believe in him throughout all of human history, were laid upon him. The father then looked down towards Christ and he treated him as if he had been guilty of all those sins. And he poured out his wrath upon him as a substitute. He, he crushed him for our iniquities. So Christ died, he was buried, and three days later he he rose from the dead and he conquered death, he, proving he is very God himself and validating his redemptive um, sacrifice. So the call of the gospel is for all men and women everywhere to repent of their sins and believe the gospel. So to repent effectively means to recognize your sinful state before God 
and to turn, turn 180 degrees with all your soul, heart, mind, emotions against that sin you once loved towards God. And then to believe the gospel is, is, is trust. Uh, it is to trust that the only reason why I'm saved is because of what Christ did in my place 2,000 years ago. So that's, that's, that's the essence of the gospel and the good news of Christianity. Hmm. Oh, that's good. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Andrew? Yeah, um, I think that, well, summarizes it. I think some of the points uh, that uh, can get a little bit hairy is on this idea of repentance and faith and what it means to repent and believe. And so often today, when we hear that word, when we hear that word repent, we think, oh, that means I need to change my life and I need to stop sinning. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there's a sense to which we can't ever really stop sinning in this life. Um, repentance has this idea that there's a change of mind, this recognition that the way that I'm going is the wrong way and I need to give up this way to which I say that I'm the God of my life, I make the decisions, I make the rules and to recognize I can't actually save myself from what I deserve. And then that belief part is, is that I recognize that everything about Jesus, everything about who he is and what he's done for me can save me and that there's nothing that I can do for myself. So that would mean that if you think that 99% of Jesus is saving you and 1% uh, of what you do saves you, you haven't actually repented. You haven't actually given up your ways. You haven't actually stopped believing that you can save yourself. Only once you decide that there's nothing that I can do but only the personal work of Jesus and you trust or you rely upon what he did for you that you can receive that salvation and forgiveness of sins. Hmm. Well, that's great. Um, one of the things I love about the gospel is that from our very first parents, um, the our, our relationship with God was broken and yet he made a way for us to be reconciled to him. And he, you know, this plan of Christ coming brings us back to God so that we'll be saved in the end. And I just love that. From the very beginning, God made this way for us to come back to him. So at the end, we can be saved. We can enter eternal life with him and we won't go to hell. So on judgment day, we will be with Christ. And I just love that God loves us so much that he did that. Hmm. Great. Um, so the next question we have uh, was, what does the Bible say about sharing the gospel? Yeah, mm. I'll give it a crack at All it. All right. I'll give it a crack at it. Um, so the first thing is, is just going back to that idea of the gospel. Um, it, is, it is not simply saying what you can do to be saved, but it is the announcement or the good news of what God has done to save sinful people. It's already been 100% accomplished. Um, but in terms of sharing the gospel, the first thing that we learn is that God saves people through words. Um, Christ, the incarnate word, mm. then goes on to save people through words. So, so it's a matter of um, there is a message behind, there is a message to be declared. So when we look at something like Romans 10, it says, um, it says how then can they call on him, they who have not, who have not believed in Jesus? And how can they believe without hearing about it? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And so there's this sense, first of all, about sharing the gospel is that there is an audible communication to which you are communicating what God has done in Christ to accomplish salvation. Um, the second thing about sharing the gospel is that so often we think about it thinking, oh, the gospel is, is out there for those people who are gifted and people who are articulated with speech, um, but that God equips all believers. What do I mean by this? Is that when God saves a person through the sharing of the gospel, he equips them with a new heart, and that new heart immediately mm. has affections and enough affections for Jesus. Think about whenever you love something, like whether it's a new piece of technology or if it's a new clothing item and you want to tell people, hey, guess what I got? And you want to share why you have a changed affection in your heart towards something and it overflows. And so God has equipped every single person with that heart who believes in Jesus, that they would love him enough to share with others. 
Next thing is that God invites and he sends all believers to be a part of his program of salvation. Um, so Jesus, in his prayer, right before, the night before he dies, says, As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And then, of course, after he died and rose from the grave and conquered death, he said and commanded us to make disciples of all nations. So he invites us to become part of this program to save people. And that's the final part, which is that God commands all believers. It's not just simply an option. It's not just something that I can decide whether I want to be a part of it. God commands every single believer, no matter what their capacity, to be part of this. This is not an option for Christians to say, I can't be a part of it. And then the final thing that I do want to just actually say is that God is faithful in bringing out believers to be sharing the gospel. So um, in Acts chapter 11, uh, verses 19 to 21, it talks about uh, a whole bunch of people being saved, but it's not the apostles who are doing the preaching, but a whole bunch of new believers and a whole bunch of other people were added to the church. And then it has this extra little line on it that says, and God was with them, which is very faithful to what Jesus says when he sends people out and commands them to preach the gospel. He goes, I am with you to the end of the age. And so God is faithful. So God, God saves us by hearing the message. He equips us with a new heart that desires to spread the message. He invites us in his program. He commands us to preach it. And then he's faithfully with us as we go about doing this great work. Um, yeah. Ah, that's good. Oh, that, a hearty amen to that, Andrew. That, <laughs> you stole most of my points on that question. But I was reminded when you said that um, the Great Commission is for every Christian. You know, you think of Matthew 28. Um, uh, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, so the immediate context there was Jesus' 12 disciples, but it's also in a broader context for any disciple of Christ. Uh, Spurgeon, uh, he used to say, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Uh, so it's one of those evidences in your life that you now love the Lord that you were once hostile to, you know, uh, and, and at enmity with. So when he says, go and make disciples, you will do as your Lord has commanded you to do. Um, and the amazing thing is this, that he has, in his sovereign decree, um, allowed us to be part of that. Um, he will gather his bride uh, from every tribe, tongue and nation, and he will use it through the preaching of the gospel. So we can be used as broken and weak vessels, and it's the message, it's, as Andrew said, it's the proclamation of the good news. Uh, well, it says his word will not return to him void. That's it, Isaiah 55. Yeah, it'll do what he, he wants to, to accomplish. Exactly, and that's, 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 that's a good point. You know, it's, I, it's almost like, I think of Matthew 13 and the parable of the, the sower. We just have to be faithful in going to scatter the seed, right? God will prepare the soil, he'll bring forth the, the fruit, but as long as we're faithful in proclaiming the message, um, his word will not return void. We don't know if his will is to uh, perhaps harden a person's heart and accomplish his purposes through that, or perhaps soften it to repentance and faith. But that should give us utmost confidence that 10 out of 10 gospel conversations are a success if we faithfully proclaim uh, the good news of Christ. That's right. And, and I mean, it's his work. It's not, if, if they don't become a Christian, it's not down to us it's all God God accomplishes what he desires and, and he said to us the fields are white for harvest so he is growing this seed that's being spread but he wants us to go out into the field and be a part of that harvest so oh, some great words guys um, so the third question uh, on the list is why should I share the gospel hmm what do you oh, okay. I'll, I'll have a go with that one. Okay. Um, so, firstly, well, I've got a couple of reasons that I thought about. Um, I think the first one is the main reason. The main reason is that um, Jesus tells us to do it. Now, he is our Lord. Uh, when we became Christians, we said, we want what you want. We love what you love. We want to serve you because you are our king. 
and our Lord. And so when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, um, we've committed to that by being his disciples, by being his people. So, um, so that's really the, the absolute reason. But I've got a few other reasons as well. Um, there are people out there who are not saved. And we should desire for them to be saved. And we should want to share the gospel so that those people can be saved from hell and be saved to have a relationship with God. Having a relationship with God is an amazing thing. Um, and we should want people to join us in that because it's a really great thing, actually. And being saved from hell is a really great thing too. Uh, the two parts of this, you know, getting to know God and not actually having to pay for your sins in hell. Like those two things alone should drive us to be out there and try and help people know Jesus and to be saved. Um, the third thing I have is um, Jesus says that we need to love other people. And by getting out there and telling them the good news, um, we are doing the greatest thing to love other people. And so that should drive us. Our love for these people out here should cause us to go and share the gospel because it's the most loving thing we could do. Uh, and fourthly, uh, my last reason here, is um, by getting out there with the gospel, we actually uh, grow closer to God because we're um, as we tell people about G the gospel, we tell people about Jesus. We, we remember every time we talk about what Jesus did, what he has done and what he's done for us. And so we think about that more. We go closer to God. Um, we, we get the joy of actually being with God on his mission. So we're kind of driving forward and we're growing in that way. We're growing closer to God. Uh, when we go out with the gospel, we know it's not our work and we know that we need God's help. So prayer actually drives us closer to God. So we pray for God to work, we pray for God to lead us, which means that we get closer to God. Um, and lastly, um, we grow deeper in our knowledge of God's word as well. Uh, when people ask us questions and we don't know those answers, what does the Bible say about this? What does the gospel say about that? Actually, it drives us to think about that and read God's word more and explore those answers. So I think those four reasons are for good reasons, but I didn't know if you guys had any other reasons. Um. Yeah, I'd say we share the gospel because it's an honour to serve our King. And like you rightly pointed out, this is the message that saved us, the three of us. So why would I want to withhold that from a lost and condemned world? So God will accomplish his purposes. The question is more so, will I participate you know, you want to be that Christian saying, here I am, Lord, send me. Not, I'm sure there's other people out there, you know, who, who would do it. Uh, Spurgeon, once again, he said, have you no desire for others to be saved? Then you are not saved yourself. Be sure of that. So one of the evidences of a heart that now loves God is that, you know, you would want to make him known. Um, and, I, yeah, I also just want to just touch upon, um, we need to think about the state of mankind in the face of their creator. Um, you know, if we truly believe God's word, we know that outside of Christ, every single person stands condemned. Um, Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is evident to them because God has shown it to them. So God's general revelation uh, through creation and through our conscience uh, is only enough to condemn us. So everybody knows God, but because of our sin, we reject him and we become futile in our thinking and our foolish hearts become darkened. So apart from Christ, man is destined to you know, die forever um, in hell. Um, George, George Whitfield, um, who was one of the greatest evangelists to ever live, he used to speak with, you know, sorrow and tears in his eyes, talking about the livid coal, the, the torment of burning like a livid coal, 
uh, not for an instant or for a day, but for millions and millions of ages, at the, when, at the end of which souls realised that they were no closer to the end than when they had first begun, and that they will never, ever be delivered from that place. So like Andrew said in that first question tonight, you know, men need to hear the special revelation, which is the gospel. Um, so, you know, they need to understand that they need to make peace with God through what Christ has done. And the good news is that Christ came to save sinners just like us. Mm. I'll just add to that. Um, oh, actually, to what Richard was saying earlier. Uh, is that when we share the gospel, or part of what is the Christian life or what defines the Christian life is that God has predestined to make us conform to the image of his son. So God, once he saves us, wants to make us look like Jesus. He wants to make us look like his son. Hmm. And part of that sanctification process, you, you look at some of the spiritual disciplines, you look at, okay, you start going to church and falling in love with God. You start reading his word. So you start meditating and thinking about the thoughts of God a little bit more like Christ and, and your communication and your words should be better and the way that you treat people should be better. And so, so much of what he's doing in us is making us look more like Jesus. And one of the essential parts of Jesus is that he was the great evangelist. Jesus was the person who preached the gospel. Jesus was the person who brought sinners to himself and invited them to respond to the good news of his coming. Um, and so for every Christian who desires to be like Jesus, which is every Christian, uh, we should be a part of the preaching of the gospel. It is a part of our sanctifying uh, being sanctified and made look like, made to look more like Jesus. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, what should we be thinking if we're not um, becoming more like Jesus in that way? Like, what what do we think about that? In terms of evangelism, specifically, yeah. how what, how should we think about that if we're not being made more like Jesus in that way? Yeah, I think, uh, I think we need to make sober assessments of ourselves, And so if we're not, to recognize that, why am I not? In the same way, in the same way about mm. everything. Like, for example, if I, if I don't find myself praying enough, and yet I see praying going through the Bible, and I don't see the need for prayer, then there's something that might be defective in my theology that gets me to stop beating the same way God's heart own beats because Jesus was a man of prayer. If I'm not loving my brothers and sisters in Christ because I don't see a great need for that and I'm not moved towards that or I'm not compelled towards that, there's something that might be defective in the way I think about God in my theology that doesn't actually have me loving my brothers and sisters in Christ more. And so in the same way, if I don't feel the need to evangelize, if I don't feel the need to see the lost come to a knowledge of God, and there might be something that is a little bit defective in my theology or way of thinking that is not compelling me to do that. And so I need to do a sober assessment on myself and the way that I see the Bible and the way that Christ's heart beats for the lost and to, to respond in that way. Um, yeah, and I'd say if you come to that realisation, you know, as part of, a, of our Christian life is a life of repentance. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a habit of the Christian life that we now hate the sin we once loved and love the the Lord we once hated. So I think like any admonishment, whether that be our prayer life, um, the way I treat my church family or my evangelism, it's to recognize it, bring it before the Lord and just, just start with small steps. Um, you know, start, you know, just who's, who's close to me already, who, where's God placed me already um, and just, just begin with that. And it's, you know, you're not gonna, um, you know, conquer a mountain, you know, overnight. Um, but I think that realisation is a very, very good first step. I think that's right. And also bringing it to God, but also talking to our brothers and sisters around us. There are many people at this church who have a heart for the lost. And if you're feeling like this is a, a difficulty, there are people here, we would love to talk to any of you, but there are other people here. If you hear of somebody who is sharing the gospel regularly, go and talk to them, ask them to pray for you, ask them to help you through this. I think... That's a really good starting place too. Um, but that brings us on to our next question. How do we uh, develop a greater heart for the lost or a greater heart for evangelism? What do you guys reckon? 
I'll take on that one. All right. Um, I think there's a way that sometimes uh, when we look at people who are wonderful evangelists, um, we think that God has given them something that is extraordinary beyond what we can attain to fulfill mm. the Great Commission. And there's a certain sense that God does give people, but certainly not in the way that we make that out to be. Um, so in terms of what we can do, uh, I think one of the big overarching points that I'd like to say to this one is just touching based on what I said earlier, that we need to have a heart that beats like God's towards evangelism. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. So often we can look into scripture and we can miss Christ where we don't actually find Christ in the scriptures, but we just do a recitation like the Pharisees. And in the same way, we can look at the Bible and miss the big picture of what God's plan is in salvation in Christ to redeem the cosmos. And so there is a sense that mm -hmm. we need to start to meditate in such a way over the scriptures in the way that God's heart reflects the desires. So one example might be, first of all, in um, his love for the world. Like you were saying earlier, Cobus, that mm. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And that word world is cosmos. Like we, in one sense, you can apply that to, to all those who believe, but the word cosmos, it almost has this grand picture, mm. this universal picture of not just not just lost humans, but the lost world that has become deformed, where we have sin, pain, death, mm. suffering. It says creation groans out for the redemption of the sons of God's bodies to be revealed. And so to recognize that God earnestly desires to redeem what happened that went wrong when man first fell. And he desired that in such a way that he sent his only son to die and to reconcile mm. the universe and to restore the world. Um, so that's the first point. The second point of having your heart beat the same way that God's does is that God is a jealous God for his glory. And God's plan is for his, uh, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the glory of God to cover the waters as over the sea. And how do we? that's how it says it in, in, in Habakkuk uh, chapter 2. Um, it says, uh, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then you have a look at 2 Corinthians verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6. It goes, For God who set let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so if we desire have that same jealousy for God to be glorified. The main means through that, that it is done, is to be revealed in the knowledge of the face of Jesus Christ, is that God is glorified more than anything else when we are proclaiming the gospel. And then the third one is that for the lost. So a passage like 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any would perish, but that all should reach repentance. There is a sense that God's heart beats after the lost and wants them to come to a knowledge of his Son. And then finally, is that if our heart beats the same way God's does, is that we should desire to see the rule and reign of Christ in that prophetic climax that we see in Philippians chapter 2 where every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord. Our greatest heart's desire should be to see the rule and reign of Christ over everything and for everything mm. to recognize his lordship. How do you do that? Through the proclamation of the gospel that you say Jesus has accomplished salvation for his people. Um, and so I think that's one way is that we need to have our heart beating the same way God's does for the proclamation of the gospel. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, God did love us so much that Jesus came. And then what did Jesus do? He came among us. And often in scriptures, it talks about Jesus loving people. And he went to the unlovely and he went with them and he loved them. And he had this heart for those people all around him. He had a heart for us too. But he just went and loved them and he looked around him and he saw them. And he saved them. And, and sometimes I think about um, when I'm out there, you know, maybe in the supermarket or a shopping center or out on the street, and I look around me and I think, most of these people probably don't know who Jesus is. And most of these people are going to hell. And I think, 
I should pray for this person. I should speak to this person. I should try and find a way to get alongside them because I know that they're probably going to go to hell. And so that works on my heart. I think, you know, I, I want them to be saved. There are so many lost people out there. And with the coronavirus pandemic, like death is much more at the forefront. These people, there are more people, you know, going to hell now than ever. Um, most, lots of people dying out there. Um, another way that I think that it helps me to uh, gain more of a heart for the lost as well is hearing how people ca became Christians. Um, I love to hear a good testimony. I love to hear how they came to know Christ. And it makes me think, actually, that person that's playing sport, I heard a testimony about a person that played sport and how they came to know Christ through their sport. And it makes me think that person could be saved as well. And it inspires me to think about them and go out there and share with them all the more. Um, lastly, I've mentioned it before already, I like to think about what Jesus has done for us and what he can do for those people too. He can actually save them. Um, I want to see them saved. Yeah, absolutely. And just to jump on some of the points you've already made, I'd say the first one, how do I develop a greater heart for the lost, is to immerse yourself in Scripture. You know, grow in your knowledge of God, of His holiness and the judgment that awaits um, sinners. Uh, you know, a type of shallow theology leads to shallow evangelism. You know, theology matters. Uh, we need to embrace that all authority has been given to God. And we also need to embrace that mankind does stand hopeless without Christ. So I'd say once we, you know, start meditating upon the glory of God, everything else will flow out of that, one of which is our evangelism. Mm. And then just to, you know, hop on the back of one of the points you made, just about the brevity of life, especially in an you know, environment like we live today, it's just to realize, you know, what James 4.14 says, life is but a mist. Um, you know, 10 out of 10 people die and uh, around 150,000 people die every single day. I'm always uh, just encouraged when I read guys like, you know, Edwards, Jonathan Edwards, where he said, Lord, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. And, you know, George Whitfield, who was actually a contemporary of Jonathan Edwards, said, God forbid that I should travel as much as a quarter of an hour with the person without telling them about Christ. You know, they saw death all around them and they knew that there's a sense of urgency needed for our evangelism. And then I'd say it's often not, it's often not the opportunities that we lack, but I know for, for myself and my own heart, it's often the courage I lack to actually, you know, speak forth uh, the gospel. Um, not, not to say it's not necessarily easy sharing our, our faith always, but we need to ask ourselves, what's driving my lack of desire to evangelize? And I would say that if we're honest with ourselves and we're to dig down deep enough into our own hearts, at that moment I'm in some way or shape more concerned about my own welfare than of theirs, uh, you know, of being you know, rejected or looking uh, weird uh, in front of my, my peers. Um, but we need to be reminded that we're not here to live just for ourselves. We've been bought with a price and, you know, it is an honour to serve our King. Um, so we're called to glorify him and, and preach the good news of Christ and what he's done. Hmm. Yeah, I'd say, um, <clears throat> just to what you were saying, um, there, there's that sense that there's the first sense to which there's some of us who have the heart problem or the problem that we're not concerned enough and 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 mm. uh, but then there is the other one which is which is when you are concerned um, but you just don't have the courage um, mm. and, and certainly having a heart beating the same way as God's does uh, gets us to that place but I, I just wanted to just uh, stack on to one of the points that you said um i remember when i uh part of part of my past life in academics i was in switzerland and i found myself so consumed uh with with my work and everything like that i barely gave myself any moment 
And then I remember um, after four and a half months, I had to leave on the weekend and I decided to make a trip to Italy. And hmm. it, was, it, was a, it was a good old time. But as I came back, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was a good old time. Uh, interesting memories. But I remember as I arrived back um, at the Zurich train station, realizing because I had my plane to catch in a couple of hours, I realized to myself, that's it. I don't think I'll have any other great experience of, of life like this where I can do this. And I have squandered my opportunity to mm -hmm. visit and to experience and to all, do all of these things. And there's this sense that the age to come and what we will have one day in Christ is going to be so incomparably glorious. But there is one thing that is going to be missing. And that is the ability to share with someone who has never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. To share mm -hmm. with them the first time. Say, hey, let me tell you about a good God who saved sinners just like yourself. We will never have that opportunity mm -hmm. in the future. Once we are with Christ, it is done. And... Just as you were saying, life is a mist. It disappears like that. Not only does it disappear for the lost, but it disappears for us as well. And if our life is taken tonight, the chance to share the good news of Jesus Christ to a, to a hearer for the very first time, it is gone. It is over. And I think that needs to sink into our hearts of what what is at stake here. Um, I just wanted to also just lastly touch on that that idea of if you if you are someone who wants to share the gospel, uh, but like you were saying, Kovas, who you lack courage, um, I just wanted to encourage you is that there is no great evangelist who hasn't been fearful of the conversations. You look at the greatest evangelist and you think, oh, what courage that they must have, but they find themselves totally and utterly weak and needing to depend on God for strength to be able to go. It is not an easy thing to be able to proclaim the gospel, mm. but they consider it and count it as blessedness for being persecuted if they were to be persecuted. Mm. That's what Jesus says in the, in the Beatitudes. He goes, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And there's this sense that even if we have this fear of man, it is something that we have to realize that we have to fight against daily and to depend on the strength of Christ to empower us to share the gospel. It is never going to get easy. It, it, no matter how experienced you are, it is just never going to get easy. And so if you stay scared, um, you miss out on one of the greatest things in the world. And that's what courage is, isn't it? Um, you know, it's not, you know, I just feel right like you know all you know f you know i don't have butterflies whatever courage is you know um, facing that fear and pressing through it and conquering it you know you hear of great evangelists even like ray comfort talk about that very point as well that you know he, he does get that but over time it's a skill it's a skill that you can get better at um, but it's not that okay well i feel it's like well join the club you know all of us do feel that you know, um, butterflies and, you know, doubts through our mind, but true courage is just facing it and just learning how to press on through it and doing it anyway. But, but of course, that courage and that boldness comes from God. Like we can go the other way and we can get too overconfident and then we realize it's not us after all. But God can give us this boldness. He can give us this confidence because he drives the conversation anyway. He does the saving. He works in the heart. He gives us the word. We have to trust him, pray and walk in it. As you take those steps forward and just trust that God will do what he's going to do of his word. Um, and... Yeah, I think we leave it all to him in the end. And, and for our confidence and our boldness as well, as, as I mentioned before, if they don't believe, it's not our fault. If they do believe, it's all glory to God. So uh, it's all him, and I'm so thankful for that. Um, mm. But uh, the next question touches on a bit about what you talked, touched a little bit on a few minutes ago, Cobus. Um, what is the connection between how I live and what I say. So I think Christian living and maybe evangelism. Mm. Is there a link? Mm. Well, to be a Christian is to 
be a representative of Christ himself. Uh, we're called to be salt and light uh, in this world. Um, let, me, let me put it this way. Say, um, say, Andrew, say you worked for your, your dad's business, right? And you had the Novich family name on all your work uniforms. But then throughout the day, you know, say you, you know, yell at people and cut them off in traffic and, you know, short pay them and get in trouble with the law. You, you'd bring dishonour to your father's name, you know, wouldn't you? Not that you do those things. <laughs> but you would bring dishonour to your God's, you know, to, to your father's name. And it's exactly the same with anybody who wears the label uh, as a Christian and does not honour him with the way we live our lives. Uh, we are called to live uh, quorum Deo, uh, in, in the very presence of God, in his face, under his authority, you know, to his glory. So to be called a Christian, you know, we are representing Christ. And I know Andrew said this before, but I think it's a very important one because you do hear it being thrown out there. Some people say, well, I don't tell the gospel, I, I just live it. And, you know, if you think about that, it just doesn't make much sense. It's like um, saying, you know, uh, feed the hungry and if necessary, use food, you know. So, <laughs> you know, it, it is the message of what Christ has done. But having said that, the way we live does make a difference in, in, in our witnessing as well. Uh, what I mean by that is that we don't want to be creating unnecessary stumbling blocks uh, to other people. Uh, when we evangelize and talk about Christ, we want to be displaying the fruits of the Spirit. We want to be loving and concerned and not critical or pompous or, you know, some, you know, that we know more answers or to win an argument as well can be another stumbling block. And we also don't want to just be using high and lofty spiritual jargon to make ourselves seem more impressive, you know. So if I, you know, hopped across the road and I go, hey, man, have you been washed in the blood of the lamb? You know, like, it's just, it's not going to make any sense, you know. So we need to be mindful that terms can be loaded and that people might have preconceived ideas behind it. So often we can just ask them, you know, uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, how did you come to that conclusion? Actually getting that person to explain where they're coming from themselves. And then last, I just want to say, we also don't want to water down the gospel, you know, so we can be so zealous and just want that person to come to faith that the temptation there is, oh, let's just brush aside God's law or his justice and just talk about God's love. But we need to talk about the totality of, God, of who God is. Um, but we have confidence that, you know, if we preach the gospel boldly enough and for long enough that somebody will come uh, to faith. Um, so God will continue to gather his bride and he is decreed for that to take place through the preaching of the gospel. But how we live does make a difference in what we say as well. I've, I've heard it said a number of times um, when people have come to faith, they met some Christians or a Christian and they've said, that person just seemed different. Um, I noticed how they lived and there was something different about them and their life seem to cause a curiosity and a what is this difference about this person and then they found out that they were Christians and that they too could be changed by Christ and have a new life so I've seen this a bunch of times their conduct has informed the people to give an opportunity to share about Jesus and I mean, people may come up to you if you're living for God and say, why did you do that? Why did you not swear when you burnt your hand? Why did you, you know, why, why were you kind to this person? Why did you do this or this? And we may have an opportunity at that point to say, it's because I love Jesus. And what do you think about Jesus kind of thing? So for me, I've seen it worked in a number of people's lives and it can give us good opportunities and good platform for the gospel, I think. Mm. Yeah, I'd just add on um, to what you guys were saying is that um, maybe, maybe to use this as a marker of Christian living and, and, and actually witnessing the gospel is that put yourself in any kind of situation. Um, say you're at the supermarket hmm. and you then 
behave in a way that is not so well, um, or you, you start to you start to be short and sharp with the cashier or something like that, in such a way that to ask yourself, is my conduct right now able to lead me into a gospel conversation, or if I were to declare right now to this person that I am a Christian, that uh, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, would they say to themselves? Well, if he's your Lord and Savior, then I don't want anything a part of that. Because there is a sense that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And God is sovereign in his purpose and plan in executing salvation. But the question ultimately comes, do we want to be participants of that or not? And some of that comes to the, uh, to the quality of our life. Do we have a quality of life that says that when I speak and preach the gospel, the good news of salvation, will that represent Christ in a positive light? Or will they think that I have no credibility to bring forward to that conversation? I think of something like when in John 1 it says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. And there is, there is of course the grace that he dispenses, the saving grace. But there's also the disposition that he comes in. And he came mm -hmm. in grace and truth. So he was able to talk to a Samaritan woman who was caught in multiple marriages, including adultery. And he was able to be totally truthful to her. But in such a measure of grace that she could still feel loved and that she could be receptive to the gospel, that she was saved. And so there is that sense that we cannot um, mm. understate the importance of our behavior. People are watching. And the moment that we declare that Jesus Christ is Lord of our life, they will be looking to find problems and faults with us. And mm. as you were saying, Kobus, we are ambassadors of Christ. We, we have to be proper ambassadors of him. See, I've heard it the, the, uh, that way as well. I've heard people say, because of how certain Christians behaved, I didn't want any part of Christ. And by God's grace, some of those people came to faith later on. But part of their testimony was early on, I didn't want to be a part of it because of the people I saw in my life who were Christians and they, well, they said they were Christians and they didn't live like them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really good point that you've highlighted there. Oh, well, both of you have highlighted. Um, yeah, it's quite convicting, hey? Mm, mm. Um, so uh, the last question tonight is, doesn't the Bible say that only some people are called to be evangelists and so only some people have the gift of sharing the gospel? What do you think? I'm happy to let you take that one. All right, all right, all right, okay. Well, I uh, gave this one a little bit of thought. Um, so uh, we've covered a little bit of this earlier. Um, uh, thinking about the Great Commission. Um, everybody is given the Great Commission. Jesus said to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. And he told them that in their role as disciples. So uh, everyone is commanded to go out. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul says that um, we've all been entrusted with the gospel. We've all been entrusted with this message of reconciliation. So the, the Great Commission is for all of us. Um, if you have a look in Acts 8, you'll see that in the early church, it was ordinary believers that took the gospel out. And so the, the first few verses there, after Stephen was martyred, um, the church is scattered and they all share the gospel. So people are going out um, and it's just regular Christians that are doing that. Uh, the third part. Now, I think this question um, is probably referencing Ephesians 4, verse 11, where it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and some teachers. So um, you may have looked at this. People may have looked at this and thought that... Um, Maybe only some people can need to share because only some are evangelists. But if you look at verse 12 immediately afterwards, it talks about them being given to build up the church. Uh, it says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. So an evangelist in this sense is given to the church by God to grow the church in evangelism. So an evangelist is a teacher to the church to teach them how to evangelize better. And so that's what an, a big E evangelist does. They train the church 
Um, now, an evangelist is often somebody who is gifted at sharing the gospel. And through their being gifted at sharing the gospel, they're able to teach others because they know kind of how to do it. But it doesn't mean they're the only one that does it. They're, they're, I think in some ways they're given those gifts so they can teach others. They can say, actually, these things kind of work. This is how we explain the gospel, this kind of stuff. So God has given us in that way. And um, as you talked about earlier, Andrew, it does look sometimes like there are people who are more gifted. Um, but yes, there are, they are gifted to a degree, but the people who tend to be gifted tend to do it more. And so as they're doing it more, they're learning more, they get more experience, they're looking at these things more, and they're actually growing in this area more and more. So the more they do it, actually the better they're getting at it anyway. And so I think when you look at it from that perspective, we can actually all grow in these ways by actually taking those steps, learning a bit more, getting the confidence for being out there, and it actually helps us all to grow in this way. Um, so thinking about um, how God has saved people of all kinds, he hasn't just saved the evangelists, he saved us all because there are people in our lives that only we can reach. Um, some of us, we may be around on the streets, we may actually be called to be a street preacher, but other of us are called to reach people who others can't reach. Like, it may be in my office, there is someone who never goes out on the street. Maybe they just go to work, they go home, and they don't go anywhere else. And it may be for me to tell them the gospel. So God saves people of all kinds so he can reach people of all kinds. Um, so we need to share as we go in the way that God has made us and pray for boldness to connect with people that God has given us opportunities when they come. Now, I don't know if you guys had any anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I'd just say... Um just to really center on that point that you were saying is that the people who seem the best at evangelism are often seen the best because they evangelize a lot um nothing very rarely does does someone come along in any sphere of life and just nails it it's usually a matter of persistence and usually you find the best evangelists who are uh, receptive to their own performance their own efforts so that they can improve why? Because they want to glorify God more. Mm -hmm. There is a sense that we are all called to proclaim the gospel, and when we do that, we glorify God. But if uh, then there's this other sense that we want to improve because we want people to come to a clearer knowledge. And so we, 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 we think about what we're doing, we think about what we're saying, and, and you preach the gospel, and you reflect on what went wrong and what didn't go wrong or what went right, and then respond so that when someone else who's new comes along and hears it, they think, oh, this person is just so incredibly gifted. Mm -hmm. um, so my encouragement would be is that if you, if you haven't yet evangelized, my first major encouragement is know how to explain the gospel. Know what the bare basics mm -hmm. of what the gospel is. And Kovis laid it out, is that we are deserving of hell and God has often asked, offered us forgiveness in his son if we would give up our ways and trust in him. So know the basics of the gospel. But secondly, just, just get out there. And then if I can add, because it's never going to happen, you're never going to fully refine your message or refine the gospel um, without getting out there and just giving it a go. Um, and then the final mm. thing of when you give it a go, um, I, I have a few friends who are very experienced in evangelism and the number one way that has improved their ability to preach the gospel is to actually spend less time talking and more time listening and more time asking questions mm. and ask questions because if by the end of the time that you have preached the gospel and then you ask how are you saved and they say oh well I just need to be a good person they hmm. haven't heard the gospel, that you've proclaimed the gospel, but they haven't heard it because our minds are so geared towards wanting to be good people and earning salvation. And so this, this idea of asking questions mm. and to see how that person is coming along will have you reflect on, oh, okay, well, why did, 
why did when I say this, it still result in them doing that? So you're saying almost like a checking question, like uh, let's make sure they're tracking with me. Yeah, let's make sure they're tracking with me. And as I'm going along, hmm. like don't just leave it for the end. Don't just wait for for once I'm right at the end of the process to or end of sharing to, to hear how they've tracked along, but to take some time and say, you know, so if if you were to be, if you were to, look at yourself now do you think god would find you innocent or guilty mm. and if and if mm. they say oh innocent it means they've missed something mm. <laughs> so so spend a little <laughs> bit more time there because they can't get to the knowledge of the good news until they are accepting of the bad news and then once you've gotten to the gospel part and explaining what jesus has done say you know if 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 i were to you know be trusting in jesus now and then i were to go and sin a little bit more but I'm still trusting in Jesus and then I were to die would I go to heaven or hell and if they say oh hell and then you say well why and they go oh because um, I've sinned and then you've you've just heard them respond back they haven't fully understood the perfection of Jesus sacrifice and then you have some time but that I guess that's the main thing that I want to emphasize is that once you've jumped out there once you've given it a go once you've trusted in the power of God you've already been obedient but continue to desire to want to glorify God and, and do that through trying to improve your method um, of evangelism. But just to recognize that you're never going to get it right. Like give yourself a measure of grace and don't think that you're going to be this perfect person. Um, you'll never arrive at that place. Yeah. And, and just to hop on the back of that, uh, I'm reminded of another quote by Spurgeon. He said, um, let each one of us, if we have done nothing for Christ, begin to do something now. And he said the distribution of tracts is the first thing. Uh, gospel tracts are a, a very easy way to transition from kind of the natural realm towards the things of God. Um, actually, I think I've got one here. Yep. This is one that I often use. It's the, the million dollar um, tract. And on the back, it's got the million dollar question. You know, will you go to heaven when you die? It's just a very short presentation of the gospel and all you do is you just say hey did you get one of these it's a gospel tract and you're just going to see where the conversation goes and if you're not quite at that stage you can just literally just you know um, put it in a menu uh, leave it at a hotel um, give it to the tradie if he comes over at your house and just give it to them that that's just one tool um, that can be used to kind of make that um, transition and there are also uh, many great evangelism uh, videos just on YouTube of mm -hmm. ministries that have been running for quite a while, uh, two that um, have been instrumental towards me, and I know many other um, Christians are Ray Comfort's ministry, The Way of the Master, um, and also Todd Friel's Wretched Radio, Wretched TV, and they, they film themselves um, going out and evangelizing on the street, and I find the more I kind of watch them you know, more, it encourages me, but you also kind of learn how to kind of give the different apologetics to objections that are raised. But ultimately, you want to get out there yourself. It's, it's one thing to see someone else do it, but another one to do it entirely. And the other thing I just want to mention is exactly what you were saying just before, Richard, just that this Great Commission will play out differently in each one of our lives. Um, evangelism will most naturally play out in our local communities. Uh, for some of us, that will primarily take place through, um, say, work among our work colleagues. Uh, for others of us, it could be primarily through, you know, pastorship uh, and preaching God's counsel week in and week out um, to the saints. Uh, for some of us, it's primarily through the raising of children and teaching them, you know, the ways of the Lord uh, at home. But for others, you know, it might very well be world missions to, to go to the jungles of Indonesia, to, to go to the tribes of um, South America. I was actually, um, I was looking at some world missions statistics recently, and I was looking at countries like Yemen and Somalia, you know, heavy, heavy Islamic influence. Uh, Yemen has a population of about 30 million, so bigger than Australia, and they estimate that out of the whole population, that there are only 1,000 Christians. And then, you know, it, Somalia likewise, you know, 16 million population, estimated 100 Christians. So, you know, say every single Christian um, 
in the whole entire world went out and shared their faith with every single non-Christian they know, and let's say miraculously every single one of those people came to saving faith, there would still be two billion people not saved. Because unreached does not mean unsaved. Unreached means that you will most likely be born, live and die without even, even just hearing about Christ. Mm. So I think for us that should give us zeal and um, just you know, such gladness that we have received it, but that there is hope at hand through the preaching of the good news of what Christ has done. And those, um, just to jump on your comment about Yemen and Somalia, um, Iran would have been counted amongst those countries 30, 40 years ago. And I think in the 70s, there was like 100 Christians there. And since then, what, 40 years, um, 50 years? <laughs> There's now like um, over a million Christians there. So from virtually nothing, these people have been inspired to seek God. People have gone to them, shared the gospel, and they've shared the gospel, and they've shared the gospel, and now they're are a lot more Christians there and the gospel is going forth. So even in countries like Yemen and Somalia, God can do his work. Mm -hmm. Countries like China, we've seen it as well. Like, you know, um, these countries where people have gone there and the gospel has grown and grown and grown. So we could see that in this country too. We could see more and more people saved. We could see it anywhere. Mm -hmm. If people take the gospel, they pray, they ask God to, to bless the words, to take his words through them. And we could see many, many more people around us or across the world becoming Christians if we actually obey the Great Commission. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, either you're the one going down into the well, you know, you're the one going overseas, or you're the one holding the rope. So, you know, even though not all of us are called to be world missionaries, um, even just through grace alone, there are quite a few that we can support, you know, through prayer, through practical needs, um, through words of encouragement. So, you know, if you don't find yourself, you know, finding yourself in that position, there are people out there doing it that need our support as well. Mm. Mm. I just wanted to add um, to, to this um, thought that there's so many people who are unreached. Um, so often we think about, like, when we hear that, we think about Muslims and, and uh, or people in these, in these far out places. But there are so many people who even claim to be Christians who mm. are unreached. They have mm. heard about Jesus. They have heard about the church. They have heard about the cross. And they have heard about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And yet they do not know the gospel. Um, quite a, a, a influential, influential preacher um, who I've watched a little bit of his stuff is Leonard Ravenhill. And he says that the world thinks it's done with Christianity when it hasn't even started. Mm. So many people, they look upon Christianity and they look at all the taints of, you know, the 20th century of what's happened within the Catholic Church and things like that. And I think I don't want a bar of that. And yet they have not even begun to hear the mm. good news of what God has done in his son. And so th there is that sense that, that there are so many people in your life, in, in your immediate life, who, who are unreached people groups. Um, oh. And God, in Acts 17, in Paul's great speech, he says he has appointed times and places mm. that people may seek God. And that means that he has placed you in someone's life that you might be the minister of the gospel in their life um, it is not by chance that that has happened uh, when I was when I was at college there was a guy there who had moved from Sydney and he spoke to a church planting organization and he said to them I'll go anywhere in Australia where there is a need for churches where would you like me to go and they said Brisbane is the place with the greatest need in Australia. And so he came and studied at QTC to serve in Brisbane. So actually Brisbane has a massive need for the gospel. As you say, there are people who live in Brisbane who think they are Christians, but there are people who live in Brisbane who have never heard about Jesus as well. Um, and so we have a lot of people around us here. World Mission is great. If you feel called to be a missionary, you should do it but there are people around here who are going to hell. And 
um, you were talking about questions before. One of my favourite questions to ask people is, who is Jesus? Who do you think Jesus is? Because if we actually explore who Jesus is and we realise he is the Son of God, what do we do with that? What do we do if Jesus' words are true? Okay. Well, did you guys have anything else you wanted to add? No. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you for joining us online. It's been great to talk about these things. And if you'd like to talk about these things anymore, we would love to talk to you about these things. Um, so please talk to us and, uh, yeah. Hopefully be seeing you some more soon.